guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. By the time you are watching this, I think we'll be on our way home, like in an airplane. Yeah. On the way home from Chicago, we're gonna go to the Aquascape Pond and Garden Tour. I'm looking forward to it. I think we're gonna see some really inspiring pondscapes. <laughs> and we're going to film them. I think we're gonna be able to go like the day before the event. It's a super quick trip, but the day before, we're gonna get to go on some private gar garden tour or pond tours. Yeah. Like we get to go to Greg's mom's house and she's hosting lunch. And I think we're going to Brian's house too. Yeah, I'm really looking for, I've seen pictures of his pond and oh my word. So I'm really looking forward to sharing what we get to see with you guys. And then the event is Saturday um, and it's a pond tour for all the people who bought tickets and then we've got a dinner and It'll be really fun. And we get to meet Kevin from Epic Gardening. You and Kevin chat all the time. Yeah. But we've never met him in person. So I think that'll be a really fun uh, time. I'm, a, I'm just excited. So we will uh, have some videos probably this coming week of our experiences there. And we get a little break. I don't even know if it's we could call it a break from the weather. I mean, our 10 days, all temperatures over 100 still. But it's dry heat. So we're going into lower temperatures, but really high humidity. So I don't know if it's going to kind of balance, balance oh, out. I'm going to probably be just a sweaty mess the whole time. Yeah. I need to take some like blotting sheets, <laughs> a dish towel. Are you going to let your hair go fuzzy? Curly. Curly. Uh, fu fuzzy is about right in the humidity. Well, I don't have any choice. Yeah. <laughs> so it is what it is. Um, anyway, let's jump into the video. So, oh, and I, I wanted to say a quick thank you to all of you guys who purchased kneeling pads. We announced last week that our kneeling pads were back in stock. The pink is already sold out. We yeah. did not anticipate that. So I think that's a color we'll probably stick with for- But it'll be a long yeah. time before we bring it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we gotta, yeah. Anyway, uh, but it's really fun to see what you guys thought of you know, the smaller size and the new color and all of that. So anyway, thank you so much for all of those orders. We really do appreciate it. And they've been working super hard down at the warehouse to get everything um, packed up and shipped out and they brought in extra hands as many as yeah. they could <laughs> to get the job done as quick as possible. So thank you to that whole team, our whole warehouse team as well. Okay, first video from this past week was planting a few things and deadheading the entire rose garden. Uh, and that was, oh, that was a hot day. <laughs> That's what I remember about it. Uh, we placed the boxwoods behind the Hartley and the parterre just placed them that day to see if we liked where they were sitting. Um, and I lived with it for a few days before I actually planted them. We replaced a, uh, an, it's a Angel Falls no, white pine, weeping white pine. I don't know if it, the Angel Falls was the variety or hmm. not. I think that was the variety of the first one I put in. Anyway, we replaced it. It was the only plant that we actually lost around the pond, which we planted a lot of stuff. So I feel like that was a really good ratio yeah. of, living plants to plants that didn't. And it's weird because that pine came through the winter just fine. It looked great this spring. And um, when I dug it out, I thought I was gonna find a really dry root ball. Like it was one that just kind of slipped between the cracks and I didn't notice that the drip wasn't run to it or whatever, but it had drip and it was plenty moist, but it wasn't too wet. So it was one of those situations where I don't really know what happened unless that type of pine just, which, and I've heard this, that just doesn't like us very much wow. here. Uh, doesn't like our high pH. Um, so it might be a case where we're, we replace the new one. <laughs> something else later but it's worth a shot at least twice if you really like that plant like a specific plant in a spot i'll give it a couple shots before i'll throw in the towel on it uh, we also planted a single fern and then a few hardy geraniums once we started in on the rose garden i didn't know if we were, we were gonna have time to do the whole thing but i got the whole entire rose garden deadheaded in just under two hours i think the camera like the main one that I kind of move around. I had it running the entire time. It was at an hour and 58 minutes. Wow. So that includes a quick bathroom break and all of the camera changes. Uh. So it really wasn't that long of a uh, project. I'm surprised that it lasted that long in the heat. I know. It didn't overheat. I know. It's I was impressive. too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Terry said, what were you using to disinfect your Felcos? I assume that is what you were doing between rose bushes. Yes. I thought about it later. And the fact that I didn't mention what it was, but it's just rubbing alcohol. And I was just, I noticed a few little like weird yellow striping on some of the leaves on just a couple of the rose bushes, which could mean a viral thing. And I just thought, you know what, we're going to be safe here. And I'm going to, um, clean my pruners between each rose bush. That way I don't spread anything around, which is just a good uh, practice to do anyway out in the garden. I don't always do that, but in that case, I thought I, I should, since I actually see something that looks a little like sketch. Suspicious. Yeah. Alan said, when will you fertilize the roses? Thank you for your videos. Uh, probably when it cools off a little bit. 
maybe. I've got some rose tone coming. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Because when I was looking, I, I did fertilize the Julia Child roses, the rose trees when we pruned them, which when it's this hot, it's kind of unnecessary, although it will sit there. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, unless we get a gully washer rainstorm, which doesn't really happen here all that often, it'll just sit there until it cools off and then the plant can kind of utilize it. Anyway, when I was looking for rose tone, all I could find was just a partial of a little five pound bag or four oh. pound bag, whatever those are. And I thought, oh, this is, a, this is not going to stretch far enough for us later on. Uh, Bethany said, I've never seen a rose like that. Litter rose? Oh, Lida. Uh, please tell us more. Uh, minute 1924. Yeah, it's L-Y-D-A. And I don't know if it's Lida or Lida rose. And in the pictures, it was a little bit more purple tinged. And it is when they very first open. But they come out in these huge, like, hydrangea panicle-esque. On the end of a stem, there'll be just this massive amount of blooms. And they're all in different stages of bloom. And so it doesn't really work that well as a cut rose. I mean, you could use them as kind of a hydrangea replacement, I guess. Hydrangeas would last, like, miles longer um, than something like that. And it's a pretty rose, so it's one that I would put in a flower bed, but probably not in a cut flower garden sort of situation again. Elizabeth said, watching this video reminded me to ask you, do you prune your spent gara stems blooms? I have some for the first time this year. I don't, we have too many of them. Uh, I was noticing there was a couple, was that maybe on the end cap of the Hartley? Some of the stratosphere white looked like they had some spent blooms. And um, then I just walked by and left them there and they're blooming again. So I don't know, I, I just, I don't tend to do a lot of maintenance on stuff like that. I was noticing though, like my one pot with uh, the persimmon and the black cherry, I, I that could maybe use a trim mm. because it's so thick and it's dealt with aphids um, and it's looking a little like, whew, a little weak. So I thought maybe I should prune that one and give it a little energy. I usually don't do that, but it might be the case where I should. George said, I always watch you and you inspire me. Thank you. I've been working hard on my garden. What kind of topiaries or boxwood can I put in full sun spots? Well, if you want something that's super tough, use a juniper topiary, like a Spartan juniper or a mint julep uh, juniper. Uh, what other ones do they use a lot? Spartans are what we see most often around here and they're just, they're tough. They are a little bit of a mite attractor. We've had a topiary junipers that have been just super clean and great. And then a couple, I tried right at the entry where we park, I tried juniper topiaries there like twice. And it's just a kind of a hot spot for mites and they got kind of taken over, but they would do that to a boxwood too. Yeah. Boxwoods are great, but you just have to make sure, especially on the boxwoods, to give them enough water and not just on one side of the pot. Like you need to go all the way around and keep those roots moist in the wintertime. Otherwise they get wind burn and they get um, like kind of dead looking leaves on one side of them. And that's what happened to, I think, the ones in front of the greenhouse this past year. They just, I don't think they had quite enough moisture to get through the winter. One of them was already struggling a little bit from the year before, I think. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You just don't love evergreens in containers most of the time. No, I'm not against it. I'm, I'm kind of against it in our area because I just don't see them survive. But you love the arbs in front of the barn. Yeah. Those are green giants, I think. But I don't know if those will last forever. This is their second year, so they went yeah. through the winter. And I just couldn't bear to replace them. They're the perfect height. Mm -hmm. They're so low maintenance. I mean, they, get wa they do get water every day. Um, our arbs typically in this area do need that during the heat. But they're so green and lush and they've been growing. Like yeah. they're happy where they're at. Um, so I've been really happy with, with that. But Arbavita topiaries generally for us is like, well, I don't even go there. Or Alberta spruce. Don't go there either with topiary style ones. Kendall said, do you ever grow out the rose hips for rose hip tea? Such a beautiful array of color. Um, I do grow out rose hips on certain roses, but I don't grow them for the hip rose hip tea. I don't like tea, so. I wish I did. I wish I was a tea drinker and I just can't make myself be one. Closest I get is the Lipton citrus green tea. It's yeah. kind of like really sweet and it only has like a little bit of that bitter like yeah. dryness to it. I will drink peppermint tea when I'm sick. Hmm. That is the only time I drink tea. When I can't, you know when you get sick and you don't want coffee? Um, it doesn't sound good, peppermint tea. No, I don't know. Yeah, you don't drink either. You love the no. smell of coffee though, right? Yeah, oh yeah. But tea, do you like the smell of tea? No. Yeah. Mackenzie said, thank you as always for the information and the inspiration. I must admit I was today years old when I learned how to choose the direction of the new branch when pruning. Does that apply to pruning all types of plants? Uh, I would say it generally does. In roses, it's just especially important because if you choose the wrong spot and the branch heads back into the center of the plant, 
it can cause problems with airflow and light and things like that. You kind of want to keep your roses in a little bit more of a vase shape and keep that uh, center from becoming too thick. Mom Marin said, were you able to notice any sign of the beneficial insects you released on the roses a few videos back? Not yet. I don't know. We've got such an incredibly high, uh, high amount of mites, spider mites, dew spotted spider mites this year. Um, I think we've created the perfect environment for them. It's been one super hot, which they love, and they love dusty uh, environments, which we have from this property right behind the barn. You know, it's been torn up for most of the gardening season, and that powder dirt had just covered everything, covered the leaves of stuff like the plants around the chicken coop, you guys, shot. Like I pulled out annuals, I cut back daylilies that were covered, I cut back dahlias that came up and were covered in mites. Um, and so we are like, I, well, Paul's been spraying some things, boxwoods, because those have gotten mites. You should see the limelight hydrangeas in front of our house. I just don't know if beneficials are gonna be strong enough uh, to keep up with the amount of mite pressure and thrip pressure that we have in this area. So, I mean, this is our second year giving it a try. I just don't know how many years you give it a try. We have to have plants that look good because that's, you know, what yeah. we do. Uh, and so I'm willing to try, you know, give it the rest of the season just to kind of watch things. But we are pocket spraying things for mites. So it's just you have to. Otherwise, like one of our limelights right by the iron stair, you know, the railing that leads up to the front porch, it's almost completely defoliated. It looks horrible, horrible up there. And all the impatiens, especially on that side, look, they look white. Their leaves look white from spider mite damage. And then it just gradually gets better as you go down that flower bed. But it's just, oof, interesting year for sure. But I can hear machines back there. They are working. It's just been such a slow process because there are so few people who do projects like we do around here. So the people who actually do that kind of work are spread so thin. Um, to get everybody taken care of. So one day, one day we'll have, have it done. <laughs> That's why like tearing out, I'm so glad we did not tear out the grass in the front of the house because yeah. we can't like Pedro, we need him here too. Right. Like to do there, we have a mile long list of projects at before we could have ever got to a project like that. So that's why I haven't touched the area up front again, because I can only handle so many areas being completely torn up in my life. Yeah. And like all the while the grass in front of the Hartley's dying because the sprinklers aren't proper and we need to reroute the whole thing, but we're just waiting, yeah. <laughs> waiting for people to come. Uh, it gets a little frustrating. I think, I don't know. I think I'm a little bit on more on the frustrated side right now because it's so hot. And like everything starts to suffer when it's yeah. so hot. And then I'm like, why isn't anybody here doing projects right now? Well, they don't want to be in the heat either. Yeah. Have you seen that meme that's like, I'm sorry about what I said to you when it was 112 degrees? Yeah, <laughs> that's me. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Uh, Paulette said, hello from Iowa Zone 5. I watch every video and this is off topic, but can you explain bolting in relation to vegetable gardens, what it means and how we should intervene? intervene. Well, bolting is when a plant just like can't take the heat anymore and it bolts and tries to go into bloom. Um, and generally we just see it on crops that are cold crops that need colder temperatures. So that's why we grow things like spinach and cilantro and, um, uh, you know, broccoli, those kinds of things in the earlier months of the growing season when it's cooler out. Once it gets too hot, they just start to bolt. So you just gotta kind of learn the um, rhythm of your season and what to plant at what time. And right after this heat wave is over, in fact, I might not even wait until it's completely over, I think I'm gonna start seeding some of our uh, fall crops here pretty quick. Usually we start doing that and uh, they have the heat at this point to germinate and come up and then it'll start to gradually cool down and then by the time they're starting to form up and be ready to harvest, it'll be cool enough to where it sustains their life a little bit longer before they start to bolt. There's really not a lot of extra stuff you can do other than just planting them at the right time of the year. Okay, next video was planting before the heat, Chitalpas, sedum, and trees. The Chitalpas, you guys, the El Nino Chitalpas. If they fall within your growing zone, I can't remember what they are. Isn't it a six through nine or is it five through nine? El Nino Chitalpa. When I very first heard about zone six through nine, when I very first heard about it, they call it a desert orchid is the common name. It's a mix between a desert willow and a catalpa, I think. I looked at those blooms, looked at the plant and thought, nope, that one's gonna die for sure. So last year when I planted them, it was really hot, uh, which was probably not the best thing. And they just stood there and looked awesome and kept blooming. The fragrance is just, it's intense and it's good. It's a good fragrance. And I just, if you're in a six through nine, definitely try them. Uh, definitely put them in the spot though, where they can grow <laughs> to 
her full size. And somebody was saying in the comment section, because I told you when I planted these, I thought they only grew four to six feet tall and wide. And, um, and then, and that's what it said at the time. And I thought I was going crazy. And somebody said, no, they've changed it because that's what it said on the tag. They had one as well. And now it says they grow like 10 to 15 feet tall mm -hmm. and like eight to 10 feet wide. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, where I planted them, they can there's not enough room. I'm going to have to create like an alley over the <laughs> pathway yeah. uh, with the, those trees. But if they act the way they did this year, like dying completely all the way back to the ground um, every winter, they'll probably never get to that size. So maybe they'll just do that, which would be perfect. I love them to stay four by four. Oh, they're a beautiful plant though. Then we planted some sedum and then we planted the birch at the end of the South Garden Loop. Yeah. So pretty. And what else did we plant that, that day? That was a good move. That was a good move. I feel like that was a really good placement. We planted a linden. We planted those two trees that day. Althea said, do you have morning dew in your dry climate? I live in New England where it's very humid. Yes, we do. Uh, and I just mowed through it this morning. Oh, you did? Yeah. You got to clean the mower after you do you that. You got gums up. But I don't want to mow out in the, like, in the, in the afternoon when it's dried off. If it stays like this, yeah. it wouldn't be too bad. It's funny though, the shade does make such a huge difference. I was running around last night doing my watering recheck and the little maple, no, they're not so little anymore, but all the maples along our driveway, wherever you could see me parked, I was parked in the shade of the, yeah. <laughs> like, it creates just the perfect amount of shade for the, gar the gator to park in. And it's incredible the difference it makes. Yeah. Like I get in the gator, I'm like, oh, the seats aren't like scorching hot and it feels okay. And then I drive out of it into the sun. I'm like, oh, there it is. Like it's just this beating baking heat on you. Shade makes a huge difference. Bloom Chirp said, do you kick up your drip irrigation during these super hot days? Some. Uh, for annuals, but not, not so much for perennials and shrubs and trees. The only zone I'm aware of that we've switched was the Versailles grass, Persephone oh, yeah. garden grass, because those surefire white begonias, like it was only running for 15 minutes every other day something like that yeah and those needed a little more and the grass looks bad up there pedro has got it on his list to add some sprinklers to those little jelly bean grass cutouts because those actually don't have irrigation and um we usually pull hoses around but we just kind of have like like they've had a little water from us yeah i've been waiting on pedro <laughs> yeah yeah so anyway we did uh, modify that one and kicked up the amount of water but everything else is kind of on an every other day schedule I during will, the heat. I will say, since we don't get a lot of rainfall in July and August, they run, the sprinklers and all the drips run consistently. Whereas in the spring, they still run for the full amount of time, but I don't run them all the time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because you'll have like a couple rainstorms that'll come through mm -hmm. and I'll kick them off for yeah. a week at a time yeah. in the spring. And same with the fall. Yeah. So like... It's I, only consistent in the summer. I like never turn our system off in the summertime. Mm-hmm but I do shut it down in the spring and the fall. Yeah. So there's just periods between waterings. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's one of those things, like when we leave to go to Chicago, if something malfunctions, yeah. we're done. Yeah. Like if we're not here to fix it, I feel like we teeter on an edge Right. here. <sighs> I think at this point though, I, I think Paul could handle it. Does he know how the Hunter, all the, the system, mm. the two wire thing? I think that, uh, I think between making phone calls and him either fixing it himself or knowing, you know, who to get a hold of, I think we could probably no make stress. it through. Uh, uh, Brianna said, We are on a tree planting journey as well. It's all looking so beautiful on your property. Are you ever concerned about those thinner trees and your winds? Do you do anything pre preemptively? It gives me anxiety every time I see our newly planted autumn blaze maple whipping around. We'll we stick it up. Yeah, we'll stick it up if we notice a lean. Usually but. the wind always comes from one direction. Yeah. And if it starts to lean, just stick it up. Well, and we usually like if a tree, because not all tree trunks are straight, and that's kind of frustrating because yeah. you're like, which part do I want to make sure looks straight? The trunk down below or the canopy up top? We usually opt for the trunk down below, and then we face the canopy in a way that we know the wind will hit it and hopefully correct the bend that it has. So if you can know that, like know where your prevailing winds come from and position your tree in such a way to where it'll maybe, com you know, combat some curvature issues, right. it is helpful. Next question from, I don't know how to say that. I'll just say G. What's your opinion on the Temple of Bloom Seven Suns tree? Hearing a lot about it. So it's a heptacodium. It's in the Proven Winners line. We do have one planted out in full sun in the South Garden, kind of by the parking area. It's right where you want to put a big oh, deciduous shade tree, okay. which we are going to be putting one near it, but over just a little bit toward the stone pathway. 
ours looks like a massive shrub. Um, it's a multi-trunk, the one that I got, and I just kind of let it be that way because I wanted it to be a block. When you're inside the interior of the garden, I don't want to see the parking area. When they bloom, which they're in bud form right now, they won't bloom until a little bit later. They're a super late bloomer, but they are beautiful and they are fragrant in a very good way. I had a different variety of heptacodium in our townhouse garden. Hmm. And it did equally as well, and it bloomed beautifully. Mary said, once again, such great tips on plants and planting. Thank you. Uh, in the opening minutes, I couldn't help notice uh, the completely scary bark on the elm. <laughs> is that normal? That is, I think I was by the mulberry tree, which is a super, super duper old tree. It's kind of a scary tree, too, because it does have rot in it. We don't know exactly how much. Uh, we did lose a couple of large branches. It was two seasons ago, mm -hmm. maybe, and then we had Natural Tree come out, and they took after it. And he said he bought us a few years, maybe, um, with the tree by really lightening the canopy load. And he, I think he told you, like, oh, she's going to be mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> because he really took a lot out, and I was kind of like, what did you do? Yeah. It rebounded, and it looks super thick and full again. Um, so I don't know. It's one of those things like, are we going to lose it in a windstorm? Yeah, I feel like, like it'll just Is it a safe tree to even leave up? I don't know, but I feel like I can't. That's such a huge piece right there, and it creates so much shade. Maybe once we have, like, the horse pasture fence in and we have everything set back up or set up at all out there, we do want to continue on with the grass with the maples along the lane right there. And that might be a good time just to say, you know what, we're ready to put something in that will actually last and something that isn't scary yeah. or a liability in a big way. Mud Dev said, just curious, now that you're very comfortable in front of your camera, do you find yourself narrating your Monday daily things when nobody's around? No. <laughs> It turns off really, really easily. Russell C. said, wait, so you filmed seven days behind. This was 7.05, but today is 7.12. Yeah, we're about a week ahead right now, and we did that on purpose because we knew that the, we were going to be gone in Chicago, and we didn't know how that would affect our posting schedule. So I got ourselves, I got us ahead <laughs> a little bit and worked extra hard to get a couple of extra videos filmed in there. So we had that buffer, so we felt like we could leave and not be like, hey, we have to skip a whole week of posting videos because we just don't do that. We're too consistent for that. Yeah. So anyway, I think by the time we're back, we'll probably be, I like to be about three days ahead is about the comfort zone level for yeah, me. Yeah, uh, three days is perfect because if you film on one day, um, we give it to Taylor, he picks it up like that evening, mm -hmm. he can edit it the next day. And then if there's any issues, you have one more day to correct a yeah. problem before it goes up. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, you can't film something and then edit, well, you, you could, but. You really can't film something, edit it that night, and then get it up the next day. I feel like we used to do that a lot. We used to do it. Well, when I was editing, we used to, and without kids, we used yeah. to do that a lot. But it's just not, it's not practical. No, it isn't. So and I think that doing things like that leads you to quitting. Oh, yeah. Burnout, big time. Because uh, it's just too much. Yeah, you've You're got spending, to build in a buffer at yeah. some point. It does get a little bit weird too sometimes because I'll take pictures and want to post them on Instagram and Facebook or whatever. And then I just never end up posting it because by the time the video actually goes out, yeah. I'm like, meh, I don't really like how those pictures look. <laughs> like I could have maybe taken better pictures. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of like, that's become so secondary to me Yeah. at this point. Next video was potting up heirloom mums, pruning tree roses, and planting boxwoods. So the four-inch heirloom mums, so I had them in four-inch containers, the heirloom mums, in the greenhouse. It's getting like, you know, 125, 130 degrees in the greenhouse during the day, even with all the sides up, windows open, fans on. Um, and they were just not happy. And we're not ready to plant them out. I think we will be here soon uh, once the high tunnels have been put up in the back of this property behind us. So I just thought, you know what, to protect this investment, I need to pot these up in gallon size. And they're so much happier. I put them outside on rolly tables and uh, they're easier to keep wet. I cut them back too, I pinched them and that was less foli foliage on top to keep happy and supplied with water. So all of a sudden the plants are a lot happier. So I was really happy that uh, we did that. Then we took after the Julia Child tree roses, which had just grown so massive. I did not prune them this spring because they just started to leaf out and looked so good. I just thought, oh, it's fine. I didn't even clean up spent blooms or anything off those. I just let them go. And they needed some attention. They bloomed beautifully, but I was afraid every windstorm that one of them was going to get knocked down. And if I lose one, well, one of them did get knocked down. The straps fell all the way down the trunk and it was laying on the ground. Mm. 
Remember? Yeah. That morning, and yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. And so I had to restake up both of them and make sure the straps were in the right places so they'd actually stay upright. Um, I was thankful it didn't rip the root system or what? I never saved that clip. I should have in the camera because it was really funny when you know when you went out there and you're just. Mouth I think I was, was blowing open. off the brick yeah. patio and I just looked over and I was like, oh. Yeah. Oh, and I just went straight to the bar and got all the crap to do the project right. and got it done. Yeah. And then I planted nine out of the 12 green tower boxwoods that I had set behind the Hartley. I only planted nine out of the 12 because I found an irrigation box right smack where I needed to plant one, but it was buried like four inches under mulch and soil. It's actually electrical. Yeah, it is electrical. Um, and I, we determined, cause I was in the video, I was telling you guys, I, why would somebody put a box here? Like, why would somebody do that? Like, this is clearly where somebody would want to put a plant that was put there when nothing was back there. Right. Like, I think we just, I don't know. They just thought this is a fine spot. It's well, kind they, of a way. They told me, they said, well, we need a junction because we're splitting at this point. Uh -huh. So we need a bunch of things to come up in this location somewhere around here. They were like, you you know, pick where you want it. Uh -huh. They had already kind of done the, the trench. Chad had already done the trench. Uh -huh. So like they could have moved it somewhere else, but like it didn't, at the point, it didn't matter. And I thought that was actually going to be a walkway. Uh huh. Which maybe it would have if we would have moved the path over a little bit. Would it have been under the gravel? Barely. It would have been a super wide path. Yeah. It's crazy. I didn't even have a design for the parterre garden yet. It's crazy that it worked around that box like it did. Yeah. Like it was perfectly in that planting bed. It wasn't in the way of their brickwork. It, right. Like it just worked out. So those boxes are still sitting there and we are going to be moving that box. Thankfully, I don't think there's live wire. Is there? Uh, there's irrigation wire in there so i think it'd be fairly i talked to them they said that they can move it and we told them you could they could just wait till it cools off a little bit yeah. we're not in any huge hurry so we're just watering those boxwoods every day yeah. <laughs> better than watering 12 boxwoods every day yeah. though so anyway it was a productive day and then we went swimming right after i was done ak sonia said you always talk about your drip tubing clogging up have you ever thought about using the half inch and quarter inch soaker hose this year I tried using the drip because I couldn't find the soaker hose last year and it's clogged already. I have soaker hose that is more than 10 years old and haven't had to change it out. I'm sticking with my soaker hoses. I have not had that kind of experience with soaker hoses. I've used them before and they crumble and fall apart. It could be an environmental, like, yeah. you know, our son might just bake the hoses too much. Um, but I had all kinds of issues with soaker hoses. They've also been very uh, unpredictable for us on how much water yeah. is coming out and at what point there would right. be huge stretches where no water would come out for no It was no willy nilly reason. too. It wasn't yeah. like the beginning was good and the end yeah, was bad. It right. was like, there's just a patch here and there in that soaker hose that just didn't work. Yeah. So the, the drip tubing, even though uh, it does eventually clog up with hard water, it's more predictable yeah. for a longer amount of time for us anyway. Bloom Chirp said, when you're not gardening, do you still wear the dark long sleeve shirts? Yep. Or do you branch out into color and lighter fabrics? Every once in a while I wore a white shirt. Every blue moon. Yeah. Also very glad to see the hat in the sun. As one who had some skin cancer, I'm extremely careful now. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm just, you'll probably see me just wear it. Um, when I'm doing long projects under the sun with no protection, you'll probably see me wearing that. If I'm moving around in the garden a lot, like in a shadier spots, I probably won't wear it. I don't like wearing hats. I never have. And I also just, like, it's funny when we're talking about going to a, like, dressier dinner, like, can I just wear black jeans? Yeah. That's what I do usually. I did try to find a dress. I did. We went shopping and I tried to find like a summer dress. It is so out of my wheelhouse and something I just don't enjoy. Like it's my nightmare. I would so much rather. We <laughs> we played a, um, what game did we play in the mall? We were in the mall. Oh, we were playing Jurassic Park. We were and by ourselves. Those arcade, those arcade machines. And we got, and I never like to do that kind of thing, but I was sitting there thinking like, I would so much rather be playing Jurassic Park right now than shopping for a freaking dress. I just, uh, yeah, I just pick something that works and go with it. And then I have so much brain space to utilize elsewhere. Carol said, how much longer until you shear the boxwoods? Do you need to wait until it's cooler? Yes. Uh, yes, we do. We will need to wait until early fall to do that. Georgia said, I love those boxwoods and the way they make the area look so cozy. I like that too. I, I think that's what I like the most about it because I think that those boxwoods can be shorn in a way to where they will make it feel like a room, but they'll still be small enough to where it won't feel like it's shrouded. 
if that makes sense. You know, there'll be some structure there, but it won't be looming over this space. I think it's going to be nice. Uh, you looked so patient when you discovered that you couldn't plant the last three. I'm glad I looked that way. The camera was on inside. I was like, <laughs> oh, um, question. Are you naturally a patient person? Yes. So patient. Resounding. Yes. Whoop. Is there anything about gardening that particularly frustrates you? I think it's just the normal frustrations that we all have. Heat, extra heat when things are suffering. It makes me frustrated, like when water malfunctions or a plant gets missed, and we all do it, no matter how good the help is, or even if I do stuff myself, we all miss things on occasion. It just happens. Um, but it can get, I think it compounds when it's 110 degrees, and yeah. you know, it just feels frustrating at that time because you don't get a break. Um, and then I think like insect issues because we're dealing with mites and thrips and things like that right now, that's frustrating to deal with because you want to choose the best route for the environment, but you also want to choose the best route for making your plants look good and finding that balance. And I think balance is so important. And I feel like balance is not talked about a lot. I feel like a lot of people take a stance and they don't talk about how there's a kind of a need for both. I think there truly is. And, you know, I don't know. I think yeah. that could be frustrating. And it's not something that I ever really thought about until there's so much information now available online and there's so many different opinions and ways of doing things. I think everybody just needs to take a balanced, open approach, open mind approach to really everything uh, in life, not just gardening. But yeah, I think that frustrates me. Sure. It gets me a little bit like, hmm. Yeah. Julie said, when training a standard, do you have to keep it staked the rest of its life? Not necessarily. Over time, the trunks will strengthen and they'll get thicker and they'll be able to support the top. It might be a while for these tree roses because, you know, the canopies are huge and the trunk is like this big. That's a lot of weight. So we'll keep our stake for quite a long time until I feel like, you know, we've got a nice, big, robust trunk. Modern Homestead Alaska said, I have a burning question. Do you record in time lapse or do you record in normal speed and edit it to speed it up? We do normal speed and speed it up in edit. I love the way you do it. And even after what I've learned, I can't figure out uh, what way you do it. That is the way we do it. Sylvia said, I really enjoy all your videos. So glad that you decided to keep the boxwoods to either side of the benches. I was wondering, don't you usually place shade cloth over the plastic greenhouse to keep it cooler? I thought I'd remembered seeing that in the past. Yes, and I think that that would help. Well, um, the reason we stopped is that we started doing two layers of plastic, which kind of lowers the does intensity. It? Yeah, I think it does. With we the can air do in shade it? cloth again. The problem is the shade cloth was really detrimental to the annuals. Yeah, but we don't do annuals in there anymore. No, we really. don't. I mean, for a very brief time until I had them all out. Yeah. Right now, there's very little in there. And I've done a mass evacuation of plants out of the Hartley as well. Uh, I left everything in there that looked like it was hanging on through the worst of the heat. And I moved everything to shaded areas in there, like moved stuff off of tables where it was getting full sun. And I've got a bunch of stuff on the floors <laughs> in here and under grow lights in here just to make it through. We could probably do a lot better out there because all the stuff that's in there, I think, can handle the sun. I think uh, airflow is probably one of the a bigger thing yeah. to tackle before shade cloth. Yeah, probably. It's too bad that that heater couldn't shoot out just air. It doesn't need to be cold air. Just air with no well, heat. We've got fans. They're just not, we haven't hooked them up. Mm -hmm. There's four fans in there that are hanging? Yeah, no, I think that they've been, there's one in the chicken coop. Oh, they there's, got farmed out? Yeah, I think they got farmed out. There are a couple in there. We were running a couple of them. Next video was switching to drip tape in our raised beds. Oh, the dreaded project that I had put off for months. And then one day, it was a Sunday, I was standing there and I started my timer on my phone. And I timed, it was just over 15 minutes that it took me, and not even all the raised beds were full. Four of them were empty. No, two, three of them were empty at that time. And it still took me 15 minutes to water in there, and I was adding up through the week. Yeah. How many minutes that was taking us. It was like an hour and 45 minutes every week hand watering the raised beds. And while I do find it relaxing, doing that day after day. You don't want to have to do it. No, and I don't want Bethany, Bethany was doing it during the week, and I don't want her to have to do it either. Um, so I thought I just got to get in there and get these swapped out. So that's what we did. I talked through some of our struggles with the drip in there, talked through our setup, every all the things, and then swapped out our quarter inch drip tube to uh, drip tape, which has emitters every six inches. And uh, yeah, it's it's been good. We've had to do some adjusting because you know in that 
project when we turned the irrigation system on it was blowing it was blowing uh the end yeah. enders off and stuff and I, it was a matter of tightening all of them and then also we turned all the individual faucets to each bed down almost all the way yeah well we turned paul and i went out there and turned them off all the way and then just opened it up yeah, a bit. And opened it just enough to where you could see the water coming yeah. out and so far nothing has blown yeah so, so. just reduce that pressure a little bit i mean we kind of have a pressure reducer valve yeah. at each right you know, so you can adjust what you need but yeah, ever since then, so nice. And then it makes me wonder, like, why didn't I do this before? In the middle of the project, I thought, I know exactly why I didn't do this before. Yeah. Because it sucks. <laughs> Doing this project sucks in the sun. It wouldn't have been so bad in the spring when it was a little bit more mild out. But anyway, when it, you have projects like that, just do it. Yeah. Do it early. It's so worth it. Deborah said, do you set them on timers or do you have to open the valve each time? It's on a timer. So it's on its own zone hooked to an irrigation box. And we've got it running every day at 11 a.m., for 30 10. minutes. 10 a.m. for Not 30 it minutes. <laughs> it's, it does. It totally matters. <laughs> Doris said, whatever happened to the automatic lawnmower robot that you had a year or so back? We have it up in the loft. Yeah. Um, I ended up not liking how it... Willy-nilly. ...did it in random pattern. Yeah. They sell them now where they don't do random patterns, but um, it's still such a small lawnmower that if you have one in a large lawn, it looks a little weird to have... Tiny st stripes. Tiny stripes, yeah. And they also, they do have big mowers... But, you know, we have so many different grass patches in our yard that um, to get one system that would mow everything would be difficult. So I'm mowing it and I, I enjoy mowing. Do you think like one of the larger ones, could you have it set up to do the big lawn and like all the South Garden grass pathways? Would, yeah. it, would it traverse the gravel over yeah. to the other grass? Yeah. They've gotten so much better. Um, just like one year after we got ours maybe two years, uh, you don't need the wire anymore. You don't oh. have to put the wire on the is edge. Is it all like GPS? It, well, like... what you do is you like, you mow it once you're set. Um, yeah, you've got like your phone okay. and you control the thing and set the edge. And oh. then forever that's the edge because it knows based on GPS data. So it's all wireless. And, and you, can, you can also, since there's no boundary, you can tell it this is also an area it can mow because uh -huh. you don't need boundary for any of it. And that's not something you'd be interested in trying? Or do you just enjoy the mowing not time? Not because of the weird lines that they Well, create. that one doesn't though, does it? Well, they make bigger mowers, but then when you get bigger mowers, it's tougher to get in smaller spots. And Those are two know. pretty big areas though. Yeah, they are. Maybe one day. I'm not ruling it out. There's something to be said though about going out, putting on your music and yeah. just taking some time just to, even though you're working, you're productive. Right. I feel... I. I, I don't know. I like jobs like that. Yeah. Where I am doing something that's kind of mundane, like mindless, but you're being productive and you have time to think and yeah. time to whatever. It's just cool quiet. with ideas for things. Yeah. <laughs> Everlyn said, why do you recut the ends before putting on the beginning and end pieces of each piece of drip tape? Because when I'm just rolling it out, I'm just like kind of, you know, getting the amount of emitters I need. And then when I'm putting on the, um, cause I did a bunch of them all in a row. And then when I'm putting on the enders or the couplers, then I kind of fine tune where the cut is made. Probably also to make it straight. Yeah. Some of them, I just like, you know, they go at an angle. I don't know. I think I was so, it was ingrained in me to make angled cuts on everything growing up oh. and to come to find out it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, so like, I remember I struggled with drip tape or drip tubing. I always cut oh, them at yeah. an angle, remember? And you're like, quit doing that. They need to be <laughs> straight cuts. Because it's hard to put on the It is. They emitters. don't stay. The, no. the couplers don't stay. Yeah. Gail said, how does Aaron drive the Bobcat and the drone at the same time? I, I kind of don't. Uh, like when I was m doing that mowing out in the pasture. I forgot that was at the end of this video. Aaron was mowing while I was yeah, doing Yeah, you just tape. get it up and have it sit in one spot and mow for a while and then move it to another spot and then mow for a while. It just kind of hovers there. Yeah, it just hovers in place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't... Yeah, maybe that's the question is they don't know that it sits in place. But mm -hmm. if you put your drone up, it'll just stay. It won't move. Hmm. Chrissy said, you mentioned in a recap video that someone picks the questions that you answer. Do you still select the ones that were picked? Uh, yeah, so I just read them however anybody picks them out. Every once in a while, I'll toss one if it seems like it's a duplicate, but I just answer what is picked. And usually it's, you know, Ken, our former editor who now runs the Garden Answer store, it's either him or his wife, Natalie, that usually pick the questions for us every week. So yeah, I don't know when I stand up here at all what I'm going to be reading. Uh, I hope you don't get mad at your subscribers when they ask a question or make a comment that you don't like. I don't get mad. At, I don't get my feelings hurt. Like, I feel like a person that 
really internalizes comments or gets their feelings hurt, it would have a really hard time having a YouTube channel uh, because those will come through no matter what you're doing, no matter how benign the subject is, flowers, you know, like yeah. you wouldn't think that there's could be polarizing opinions, but somehow people find them. The only time you get upset is if you, if there's like a smidgen of truth to, um, some like correction that somebody like, why would you plant the espalier up in a super high raised bed? You're not going to be re- able to reach the top yeah. level. I'm like, shut, <laughs> yeah. well, shut your mouth. You I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> like I kind of knew when I did it and then I thought, oh, it's too heavy. I'm not going to move it out now. I'm sticking yeah. with this, this yeah. thing that I just did. I'm going to defend it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But otherwise when people are acting immature and you know, they'll like name call you, you can kind of put those people in their own little box and just be like, okay, well, Mm -hmm. this is probably like a special person that I'm dealing with here. Mm -hmm. And you can't take comments like that too serious when, when they're absurd. Yeah. When somebody's being like mean, but, but absurd about it or is like super uninformed or when they try to take things in a direction, like they are trying to bait you. Yeah. Like politically or with religion or about your animals or Or something like that or kids. Um, but that's a special box Yeah, for special people as well. (laughs) For sure. I feel like I'm pretty good at uh, letting things just kind of roll off. I don't think about it yeah. in my spare time. So, Law Girl said, I rewatched your video recently setting up the hose faucet for your sister in law. Uh, for your sister. I don't think I hooked one up for Monica. I think we did for your sister. For Alyssa, we did the raised bed. Anyway. Yeah. For that setup, does the hose faucet need to run all the time or can you turn it on or off daily? You can manually turn it on and off, but those timer things, you've got the hose on. Like the faucet's on, it's set. And it won't run unless the timer, unless it's broken or unless the timer says it's time to run. And then it shuts it off at the timer level instead of the faucet level. There's a valve inside the timer that opens and closes. Right. Mother Knit said, if you had to start your cut flower again from scratch, would you do anything differently? Oh, I don't think I would do anything. Well, you know, I would make sure spacing was proper. (laughs) I make sure there was enough space between rows so you could walk around, but... It's very pretty in the abundance too, in the abundance phase where it looks like you can't even traverse a space. It's just so full and so cozy. At this point, like I'm ready for a change. I'm ready to change that space and we're going to change it pretty dramatically, I think. I'm just a little, little tired of the whole cut flower garden. There's so many of, of so much of that out there. And I'm a little just like, I did it, you know, and I'm just like, ready for something, a new challenge out in that space. Not to say that I won't have flowers to cut. I also uh, realized that I don't, I do enjoy arranging flowers when I'm in the mood to do it. I don't enjoy tending to arranged flowers inside my house. Like I, I hate to pick up uh, spent flower arrangements and like the stinky water and cleaning out vases. That is just not my jam. I like to grow stuff and I like to look at it outside. So oftentimes I just grow this cut flower garden and uh, just for the experience of growing things and trying new things out and showing you guys the process, I like to look at it out in that space. And I thought that it would make me feel more free to cut things. And I do, I feel all the freedom to cut whatever I want out there. But at the same time, I enjoy looking at it almost as much out there than I would bringing it in. Sure. I don't know. It's just kind of a weird deal. But yeah, I would say make sure the spacing is right. That's probably the biggest one. Yeah, I don't think I would necessarily change anything else about it. I'm pretty happy with how we ran the water. Yeah, that's been great. Yeah. There's like a header line and then there's usually three rows of drip tape for each, you know, planting row. We do them about a foot apart and they're 60 foot runs each. Yeah. I think it's overall been a really positive experience. Roxanne said, I use drip tape as well. Have you found an effective way to keep the lines in place besides landscape staples? My lines are about 40 foot in length and seem to move more than I want them to. They will. They will move. Even with with the landscape staples, they tend to want to move. Um, So we have just increased the amount of landscape staples we use. And then usually if you bury them, if you put them under compost, once you're confident that they're running well, um, if you put compost over the top, they just won't have the ability to shift around as much. And that's very helpful. And you can totally cover them. It's not going to hurt a thing. Shauna said, I have 20 raised cedar beds. Four are four by eight and 16 are 12 by three. I don't have water to run to the garden, but I'd love to run drip. I'm in Northeast Ohio. So we get lots of rain, but usually June is dry. And that's when I'm planting. How would you install drip if each bed didn't have its own faucet? If you watch when we did the system at my sister-in-law's house last spring. Maybe we can link it down below. Um, We set up a whole system running it from a faucet that came out of her side of her house. We had to trench the line over to her raised beds and then we showed you the whole process. 
Lion Hawaii said, in the winter, will you have to remove the drip tape? In zone 4B, our first snow is in September. I have a quarter inch brown tubing, but place, plan on changing to drip tape. Uh, you do not have to remove drip tape. You can leave it out there. Some of the stuff we used last year, I'm still using this year. Uh, we kind of assess it. Some of it just doesn't plug up as quickly. It's yeah. just kind of a little bit hit and miss. Some we can get a couple, three years out of. Some we have to replace, you know, every season. So it just kind of depends. Patricia said, will you start cabbages, onions for fall planting? Is this the time to plant seeds for decorative purple cabbage and kale for fall? I have cabbages growing in the greenhouse right now that are about this big. Uh, so we'll probably get those out after the heat goes. But yeah, now is a great time if you're starting seeds inside um, cabbage, those kinds of things. You'll probably want to start them inside where it's cooler and then plan to move them out a little bit later. And then the next video is artichoke evacuation day and potting up 60 baby grasses from one of our winter sowing water jugs. I still, still have a few winter sowing water jugs in our greenhouse right now. And can I say, I didn't see a single comment about the big rip in my shirt. <laughs> Did you see any comments about that? No. I, cause that video just went up this morning. And so I kind of skim, I always skim in the morning. Uh, when I get up just to make sure there isn't anything like egregious that we left yeah. in the video or, you know, a mistake or whatever. And I didn't see a single comment. I had a huge rip. And I knew I had a rip in that, in, yeah. in that shirt, but I just forgot. Kind of hulked out a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I guess. Well, I've had these shirts. This is another one. It's exactly the same, but it's sans rip in the back. I've had them forever. Eventually they just kind of start to give out, you know? <laughs> anyway, I was like proud of everyone for just like not seeing <laughs> it or not being distracted by it. But I pulled all the artichokes from the uh, cold frames in front of the Hartley. And during that video, the artichokes did not look that bad because the Hartley was in the shade, but it's only in the shade for a very short amount of time during the day. And then it gets sunny, hot sunny. And those artichokes looked they, they kind of had a yellow tinge to them. They were looking dry and kind of brown. Few of the blooms still had a little bit of color, but um, overall, they looked like they were tired and we, I was ready for a change. And then we separated all of the grasses from that winter sowing water jug and potted them up in four inch containers. Barbara said, oh gosh, will you save any of them for dried arrangements? They are really pretty and I'd save some. You know, I hear that a lot about the artichoke things. Uh, yeah, I don't, I've saved artichokes before and I never use them for decorating or for projects at all. They're so bulky and a little bit hard. I have some fake ones that are gold that are really cool looking that I would, that go really well like at Easter time. And so I'm set. I don't ever really feel like I need to save those for arrangements. Cynthia said, can you grow marigold seeds using the winter sowing method? I'm in zone six. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great one to start winter sowing. Kyle said, satisfying. How has the wood log filler worked out under all the soil in the cold frames? How many years ago was that? A couple years ago. Yeah, now, two or three. Uh, we put a fairly decent layer of firewood. Yeah. Because we had a, a massive amount of it at the time. And those cold frames, I could stand in one. They were so deep. Like, Have you noticed the level going down? or Slightly, but it, that always happens. When you yeah. pull plants out, it takes some of the soil with them. I haven't noticed a tremendous amount of settling and everything we've put in there has done really well. See, it's awesome. It is. It's an awesome idea. Yeah. I mean, in yeah, that case, it was just, how deep were those? Five feet? Pretty deep. Four feet? Five, yeah, they were pretty deep. Well, because, um, yeah, the, the way they had us design the Hartley, the stem walls went down a long way. They did. So they had to dig down that whole way. Yeah. So it was just open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lisa said, all those grasses, what would happen if you just split that jug into four or so larger clumps? I'm too lazy to have done all that work. Eventually, I think they would kind of crowd each other out. Um, they'd probably compete and maybe one would win or maybe they would all kind of suffer in the end. I thought about it though, I'm not gonna lie. Rebecca said, are artichokes spiky? Like, do they have thorns? No thorns, I didn't, they're not really that spiky. I mean, maybe the leaves are a little uncomfortable on the very tips, but did I wear gloves? I think I wore gloves that day. I don't know. I've been spending so much time in the swimming pool that like the ground and dirt in my fingers is finally starting to disappear. Oh, there you go. So I'm like, well, I've got a little bit of it still left, but I thought, you know what, if I wear gloves, that would kind of take down the amount of ground and dirt I have, yeah. <laughs> but they were not uh, at all hard to pull out. I thought that I was going to have to tie them to the gator with a rope and pull them out, but they just all but two came out really easily. Mimi five Jack said, don't you have any problem with the grass seeds spreading everywhere? I have tall grasses and I'm sure that is what is going on uh, in my flower beds. 
Uh, not really. I mean, some of them will sprout up a little bit, but again, we have to have everything on drip irrigation. So if you live in an area that's a lot more moist than ours, you might have a lot harder of a time with things reseeding than we do. Missouri said, uh, and the angels rejoice, <laughs> Aaron's reaction to the artichokes coming out. I couldn't help but laugh out loud at that. Did you ever get any artichokes out of those? I know you don't like them, but I was wondering if they produced fruit. They produced a ton of fruit, a ton. Did we eat any of them? No. no. I know that's probably hard for some of you guys who love artichokes, but I grew them for the beauty of the plant and the bloom, and um, they're super easy to grow. Super easy to start from seed. I have a pack of the seeds right here, so we can do, we can replicate the same exact thing again very easily. Okay, and the last video from this week is actually the recap from last week. Is your warehouse on your property? How many different items do you sell? Uh, angers? Oh, augers. Falcos, um, have I missed anything good? Our warehouse is not on our property and we have a whole bunch of different things. You can get on our website, gardenanswer.com and check it out if you want. The plan is to keep just building it out and offering yeah, kind just of slowly, kind everything of, eventually. Yeah. Darlene said, okay, the math doesn't work. You said you've been married 18 years, but you're 32. <laughs> You'd have to get married when you're 14. I don't think so. Did I hear wrong? Maybe you said 42. I am not 42. <laughs> I will say that. I was kidding when I said 32. <laughs> But we have been in September, we'll have been married for 18 years. Yeah. We did get married young-ish, though. So I am not 42. I'm for a few our years area, away from that. Uh, it, we got married at kind of like a normal time. Yeah. Um, people get married pretty young here. Yeah. There's nothing to do here. <laughs> so like people that... Uh, get married, start a family. Yeah. We it's just like waited you, a long time for that. Yeah. you. A lot of people get married before college or mm -hmm. in college. Uh, so like... That's pretty normal. Yeah. Jenny Gardens PW said, do you guys have multiple wells or are you able to run everything on just one? We have three. Yeah. Three wells. Lori said, I have hydrophobic soil. How can I improve my soil in my yard? Organic matter. Just start hitting it with compost. More, the more compost you can add in there, the better. Trey said, speaking of trees, have the avocado trees survived? I was curious about that too. The big one looks great. The small one perished, unfortunately, which is weird because I thought it was going to be the other way around. Uh, but the big one pushed a bunch of leaves, actually bloomed, and I thought it was going to be putting on fruit there for a second, but I think it aborted the fruit. Mm. I think there were a couple on there. Uh, but it's pushing leaves and looking great. It's still in the greenhouse. Valerie said, I always love the recap videos. I learned so much from the questions. My question, during this very hot weather that goes on for weeks, do you continue to fertilize your annuals on the same schedule or do you adjust for heat stress? We continue on every week water soluble fertilizer jgg7377 said question when will we get a tour of the garden answer warehouse this probably this week yeah i don't know with the videos coming out from aquascape i think it'll be this next week yeah i don't know if it'll before. get pushed or we not. did run down there and show to yeah. show you guys though celtic dancer sue said i'd eagerly buy your kneeling pads and other merchandise however the shipping cost ontario canada is way too high for me is there possibly a more affordable way to ship I mean, we don't dictate the shipping prices the shipping companies do. Maybe it's like a, a bulk thing. Like maybe if we shipped way more than we do, we would get a better rate. Yeah, I, don't I know. know from talking to Ken that uh, shipping internationally, which we do, is a nightmare. Mm. And it, it ends a lot of times with everybody being disappointed mm. because... I think people in other countries think that it should be quicker and cheaper and there's so many customs issues where stuff will sit in customs mm -hmm. for a ridiculous amount of time mm -hmm. and then they'll the contact and Ken or uh, Riley will try to say like, well, there's nothing we can do. Your country is keeping it in customs and won't release it. Right. Yeah. You <laughs> We're know, stuck like, I can't do anything about that. And then they'll request a refund, but then it'll get released like right about the same time that people get fed up and they're mm -hmm. like, I'm not waiting any longer. Mm -hmm. And so then they'll get the product and then they want to ship it back. And then somebody has to pay for that. Uh -huh. And it's, it's a nightmare. I can totally understand now why so many companies just say, no, we're, you know, yeah. 48 States. That's what we do. We're not mm -hmm. doing anything else because they don't have the manpower, the time to mm -hmm. figure out why things are sitting in customs for so long. Mm -hmm. So, well, that's what happened with our Mesto sprayers that we ordered. Yeah. We waited like, forever they four sat. months or yeah. something like that to get those to get them released yeah it's just because those come from what like germany or yeah i don't know what country they come from yeah i think it's germany yeah. or or italy maybe mm, i don't remember either way it's it a pain a but, and i can honestly see a day coming where we also say no, no. more international shipping just because it's too difficult mm -hmm. but thank you for saying that you would buy one that's yeah. really that's really nice that's 
That means the world. I think the only way you can get around it is by actually having warehouses in those countries. Sure. You know? Yeah. And if we ever get to that point, I don't... I'm guessing we're not going to get to that point. But. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> it's probably not. And you guys, that is it for today's recap video. Looks like a nice day. I know. <laughs> like, now what do I go do? Perennial maintenance out yeah. of beds. At least it's overcast and a little bit breezy. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful. And I hope you're having a great start to your week. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.